And it's very, very rare. That's why it's so exciting around this time, because it's very rare that a new owner gets to pick his new GM and the new GM gets to pick his own head coach. And then the own head coach gets to pick his offensive and defensive coordinators. That usually doesn't all happen at the same time, because the top part of it, the owner is very rare to get a new owner. Um, and I just yeah. feel that this is a unique Unique situation in Washington that yeah. everybody is starting at the same start line. And the yep. patience that Josh Harris showed through last year and getting to this point speaks volumes too, right? Because he didn't just, you know, jump the gun and start making a bunch of changes too quickly. He was able to kind of do it the right way. And then we all start on a level playing field. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's great. Yeah, and the, the timing of it and the way that it worked out, too, I thought was just uh, – it's just lucky for the franchise, honestly, in that, yeah, the timing of a guy like Josh Harris, who has already been in the NFL for a while, is now – he's the guy the next up. He's the next up to buy a team, and then our team becomes available. That's lucky, right? We don't end up with a David Tepper or something of that situation, you know? We end up with – we're in great hands right with Harris and then Adam Peters finally ready to go ahead and leave San Francisco. That's amazing timing that that works out. And then the head coaching class was, I haven't seen a head coaching carousel this full of talent in a while. I mean, I remember I said to pop pretty early on when everybody was super high on Ben Johnson, I said, look, Dan Quinn is a guy that would be the number one candidate in 75% of years. It'd be the Dan Quinn chase. And he was obviously not the most hailed after candidate during the process, but the perfect guy for this job. Yeah, even point. someone like a Raheem Morris who ended up in yeah. Atlanta. I mean, I know we were really high on him too. Like mm -hmm. there were good options available for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then yeah. such a such a stacked quarterback class. And then the wisdom from Harris to say, okay. Let's get the draft picks for Sam Howell. Let's get the draft picks for Chase Young. Let's get the draft picks for Montez Sweat because you know what? We got to build this thing. We need to capitalize while we have this opportunity. And like you highlighted, Lou, such a unique situation in the way that it's all come together. Let's make it happen. So that's really exciting about that. A, a cool nugget about the, uh, the Bobby Wagner thing is I think we've had this funny little side discussion as like this is – super football nerd stuff, but that's what we all are, right? We've had this funny little side discussion about who's going to wear the green dot on defense <laughs> for the last three or four years. Oh, is it going to be Cam Curl? I don't think Jamin Davis is ready, but it's a little weird to have a safety doing it. I don't know what we're going to do. No debate this year. It's Bobby Wagner. Bobby Wagner is going to wear that green dot, and I don't think there are many guys in the NFL, aside from maybe Fred Warner, that you'd rather have wearing the green dot on yeah. your defense. So that is – that is super exciting there. So let's let's take a look. I think it's probably going to be our last topic for the pod, but let's take a look. How do we think across the NFC East? This is a division that, you know, two years ago was looking like, wow, we are uh, we're in for a ride. I mean, we've got two stalwarts in Dallas and Philly and even New York and made it to the playoffs, and it was the NFC beast, people were calling it. And then we saw in the last half of the season – a pretty wild fall from grace between Philly and Dallas. And you wonder, okay, how much of that is going to carry in the next season? The NFL is so up and down. There's so much parity between injuries and, you know, the heads of security getting banned from sidelines for the rest of the game, <laughs> for the rest of the season. Like you just, so many things can change from week to week. Right. So where do we think we stack up in the NFC East? Where do we expect us to, perform in the division, that's that's something I want to kind of bring to the table for us to discuss here. Yeah, that's kind of hard. Uh, I'm with you on every category that we talked about, but that's kind of hard for the, all the positions, all the things that you just mentioned. Oh, uh, no. Phil, Phil, Philly just got a lot stronger with Saquon Barkley. Um, I just feel that there was still a lot of talent there. For some reason, you know, uh, I have some history with Philly being from the, the South Jersey right. area and still check in mm -hmm. with a lot of my – you know, my friends and fraternity brothers and things that that nature and everybody all said to themselves that, you know, j um, it, it just looked like they weren't having as much fun. Um, it just looked the quarterback. The, it just looked like, you know, a lot of pieces that just weren't having as much fun. 
Um, so yep. I just feel that they're going to probably get back to that. They still have a lot of weapons. Um, I don't think that um, the, the, the good thing about – the interesting thing about it, our division, the, the NFC East – um, is that you never know with that division. You just really, really yeah. never know. Um, but I, 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 all I can, all I can say is that if this team does what it's supposed to do, I mean, again, the bar is so low. They only won four yep. games. Right. You no, know, you mentioned if they win eight games, are you going to say that this was not a success? Wow, I'm amazing. like, if this team wins four more games and doesn't make the playoffs, are you saying to yourself that you're disappointed? I'm not because I'm like, look, you could, you could get a Houston Texans lightning in a bottle and it all comes together and whatever. But the more realistic approach to all this and line to all this is that you are going to have to uh, have a couple of years, right? So, um, you just got to think that Dallas is, was hamstruck with with Dak's contract, and you know now Dan Quinn is taking all the players and win. Yeah. You know, so you got to think that I think that it's now. I don't think that there's too far of a talent gap between the teams, but I couldn't even tell you where they're gonna where they're gonna fall. I, I really couldn't. Um, but I think the big thing, as we all know, is you you got to stay healthy. Yeah, well, I think health it's is such health is such a big part of the NFL that you just got to stay healthy. So it's so much about that. I think you made a great point. It's so much about what it looks like as much about as much as it is about what the record is. And we got swept in the NFC East last year, right? To go from being swept and having not even being competitive against the Cowboys and losing, being swept by a Giants team that you that you. Felt like those are a couple of games that maybe we could have, you know, at least split. Absolutely. Uh, played the Eagles tough, which was probably one of the highlights of the season. But, you know, can we be competitive and, yeah. you know, get our fair share of games? And what does it look like? Does it look like we're improving? Are the coaches scheming up a game plan that fits the players, right? How do we develop Jaden Daniels or any rookie quarterback that would have been in that spot? Do we put them – in a position where all the pressure isn't on them to succeed. You know, we, we're spreading it around to the teammates. So I think so much about what they look like. And then you try to understand, you know, how much better did we get versus how much better did the rest of the division get? And it feels like that we've made some progress there. What I worry, what I wonder about with Philly is Sirianni. You know, almost it feels a little bit almost like a Doug Peterson, you know, when you said they're not having as much fun. And the way things kind of fall apart a little bit at the end of the year, does he still have the locker room? Does he still have the respect of those players? Because it felt like something was off the way they finished that year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's let's hope that they don't have. Yeah. <laughs> let's, hope that, let's hope that there's disarray in Dallas, New York, and and Philadelphia, uh, and there's just unity here. That would be fun for a while because um, you just said it to be swept in your own division, to lose home games. That Thanksgiving game was an embarrassment. Ooh. People jumping into salvation, uh, are, you know, getting food out of salvation army buckets and stuff like that. I mean, it was just bad. It was just really, mm -hmm. really bad. And I think that you, you said it so, so well, pop, you said it perfectly. It's not, it's how you are playing and the competitiveness that you are in these games that is going to say a lot because, again, this is a new head coach, a new offensive and defensive coordinator that kind of got to get themselves um, on sync a little bit on what they're doing. Sure. But, uh, I just feel that there's talent where um, if you if you knew how to use that talent last year, I don't think you're winning just four games. I think you're Not winning yet. a lot more because, again, the um, – there's a fine line between winning and losing in the NFL. And it's not like in some of those games that we they, they weren't competitive enough, right? But my goodness, that Miami game, um, the, the the Dallas game, there were a couple other games where you're I'm in the press box like this is embarrassing. You know? Totally. Um but yeah, that's how I feel on that. That's how I feel on that. Um Yeah, I, I agree. And I think something you touched on, Lou, is that the yeah. 
we won four games last year, right? And if we win eight games next year, let's say we go eight and nine, or let's say we even pull the famous eight, eight and one that we've been known for around this town, apparently. Let's say we go eight and nine. We have every reason to believe with the way this team is built right now and set up that if we make a four win improvement, that okay, now it's time. Compare how we would feel at the end of this season, eight and nine, to how we felt two seasons ago. Eight, eight, and one going into the next year. It's night and day. It's right. night and day. There's no, you could look two years ago and say, I, we said it on the pod. We all tried to spin it and said, hey, this Howell kid, he can't be much worse than what we've had these last couple of years. Maybe that's a two win difference and the defense maintains. But the difference between that and, all right, now we've got our quarterback going into the second year, our head coach going into the second year, coordinator second year, all these rookies. And we made a four-win improvement with everybody just starting to figure it out. Now you really look like, all right, it's time to take the wheels up and take off this thing. So it's it's really exciting. And I think even like the comp that I make for this team, I think is the 2022 Jacksonville Jaguars. A lot of people want to talk Houston Texans. I look at Peterson's first year in Jacksonville after Urban Meyer. Obviously, that was a team that you would rather play in September than in November. And I think that's going to be the same situation with this team. There is going to be some growing pains. There are going to be some things to get over. But I think by the end of the year, you're going to see a tough, scrappy team that has bonded together, started to follow the – drink the Kool-Aid, so to speak. Started to buy in good. to what that's we're a good selling comp. here. That's I a good think comparison. that's what we're going to see. That's a good comparison. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I did want to say something because um, uh, you, you, you touched on it, Pop, and Dom, you, you, you could totally agree with this. It's this um, we talked about you talked about Josh Harris. Uh, and I do want to say something that um, is another sign of overall culture change and things going in the right direction um, as currently constructed. That Josh Harris ownership group got this team handed to them a couple of days, weeks before training camp started, Mm -hmm. right? For them to have to sit there and endure all the crap that had to happen, right? But not have any type of knee jerk reactions and things like that. That says a lot because it had to be hard to sit there and do that, right? Now Now they have a full season and a full year to have boots on the ground, to know what they're going to do. And you can see one of the prime recent um, evidence of that knowledge and that change was before they even drafted Jaden Daniels on that draft, the way they started that draft by announcing that they were going to retire Daryl Green's number that was a stroke of genius to start are standing off, to start, up. To, start <laughs> to start off your first draft as an ownership group and the future paying homage to one of the greatest cornerbacks to ever play the game right for us to sit here and say wow um that is the way it is done right and you know dom you said you know you don't want to put people under the bus and stuff i am I'm going to tell you right well, now. One case, yeah, I'm going sure. to tell you right now that uh, from longtime uh, Washingtonians, for Daryl Green and others to not want any part of this franchise because of the mess that was going on, to see him not only make that video where they surprised him, but to say he was going to go to the draft and they announced the pick. Right. And to hear the commissioner saying that we already knew it from a day before, but to hear the commissioner say that the Washington commanders is going to retire Daryl Green's number. I mean, it just brought chills to so many people because I love Sean Taylor and I think that his number should be retired, but not over Daryl Green, no, not over John Riggins. Not over a bunch of people who played here for so much longer. That was a Hail Mary from the last ownership group to kind of say, hey, look, we're going to. But the way it was even done, we found out about the Sean Taylor um, uh, number being retired like a week or two weeks before it happened. Right. I talked to Pedro Taylor. He didn't even know. he. There was none of this, you know 
off season. We're telling you what's going to happen. And here's how you can plan to be in attendance or know when this number is going to be retired. It wasn't snuck up on anybody, right? They yep. did it the day of the draft. They mentioned that they're going to have number 28. I mean, nobody nobody dare wear 28 after he finished That's playing. Right. But now to have that number officially retired and the way the Harris group did it, that is another thing that you can look at is change. There's going to be a lot of former Redskins coming back now because they now feel energized. They, 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 um, you know, the fact that Daryl Green's number was never retired under the old ownership group is it, it's that's an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment that that he is the greatest Reds, one of the greatest Redskins to ever play. Um, and I again. The number 21 definitely needs to be retired. But the way that was done, over 28 and some others, I think that it's being rectified. And I really, really wanted to bring the optics and the Great. PR into play here because that means a lot to the people that knew uh, the time, the bridging the Charles Mann and the Dexter Manley, that they would come to the stadium and participate in some things. But now you can see, he said it, Daryl Green said it, I'm back. Yeah. He said it, I'm back. I mean, mm -hmm. how great is that to hear that one of your greatest players who was maybe jettisoned from the, from, from the franchise feels good to come back, not because he didn't love the franchise, is because the drama and the mess and all the stuff that was going on Daryl didn't want any part of that. Charles didn't want any part of that. There's a bunch of people who wanted no part of that. And now, I mean, it's like it's like being in Detroit and not having Barry Sanders being part of the franchise, right? Yep. I mean, it's crazy not having Montana and Rice be part of the franchise, right? Daryl Green is Mr. Redskin. And yeah. so for that to happen, I, 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 as somebody who has covered this team, for 20 some odd years and somebody who is a proud um, uh, supporter of the franchise to see that actually done in the way it was done. That made the draft so much special, so much great. more special for a lot of people knowing that they got that right along with everything else. They got that right too. You could, you could, you know, everyone's got their favorite player and, and thinks about who they was. And it depends on eras, you know, Daryl was before Dominic's time, but it, to have a 20 year career, to have two Super Bowls, to play at that level, and then to be the type of man he was off the field. Oh, yeah. Family, giving back to the community. I don't know how you could rate any Redskins slash commander ahead of Daryl Green. My yeah. humble opinion. He's at the top of That's the okay. Mount Rushmore. And his bust is in Canton. It, he's. His it's, bus it's, is in Canton. I mean, how do you, right. how do you, how does that, how does that happen? Even under the old ownership group, when Daryl Green put on that yellow jacket, his number should have been retired right after. Yep, 100%. So I just feel that that is, to me, that is as big as the draft for me because you have to, as this ownership group, you have to embrace the people that have checked out, right? And the reason why they have checked out, right? This is the people before Dom's time. These the, the people have checked out is because the alumni um, were not really, really embraced like they should. Um, it's, the, it's the alumni and it's the effort to connect with the community. And correct. that's what I really hope we see as well. Mitch Rails was yep. quoted yep. recently at talking about creating that Hall of Fame uh, it, outside the stadium and then creating free trips for, you know, young kids to go and where the team pays all in. That's how you get fans. That's how you build generations of yep. fans connecting to the community and, and, and building and that's that That's what they way, need to do. You know, that's what they need 100%. to do. They, they hired Adam Peters and they hired Dan Quinn to take care of the football stuff so they can start taking care of what you just said, Pop. The reaching out in the community, the, the getting Magic Johnson involved, reaching out and getting these people back yeah. so we're all together. Uh, because I remember I did an interview with Daryl Green and I asked him about what we're just talking about. And he said the biggest disappointment for him is the lack of impact that this team had and now he said it was like it's just been poured out on the street right that used to have 
regional impact. The Washington Redskins brand had regional impact. And he said for years it had just been gone. Right. This was when I interviewed him a, a while ago. And now when he says that he's back, man, that's a big, big deal. And I think that that is what true ownership should be doing. Leave the football to football people and yep. you worry about owning the team and everything around that. And the Mitch Rails and the Mark Ein. Mark Ein is huge in all of this as well. Getting the community and getting things right. There should be more players from those from those years that have their numbers actually retired where nobody's actually even wearing who's gonna wear 44? No one's stupid yeah. enough to wear 44, right? So yeah. go ahead. You know no, but the thing is, that it's the way it was done. Now, when the schedule comes out, because you know the NFL is good for having you all excited all year round. In a yep. couple of weeks, you're going to have the 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 the, uh, the schedule being released, and everybody's going to want to know when is that game where Daryl Green's number is actually going to be retired. There's not going to be no guessing. There's not people are going to be able to fly in if they're from other states and countries because they love Daryl. And that stadium, wherever it is, that stadium is going to be rocking because the way they did it was right. The lead up is good. Everything is good. Nobody is questioning anything with this Harris group because they only just got the team less than a year ago. And Tom, I, I don't know about you, but I'm fired up. This I, is all I'm ready to run through a brick wall. Look, I, it's just, it just can't be on the field. It just can't be on the field. It has to be all the other reasons why this is a crown yeah. jewel of the NFL. And a lot of that yeah. is because of the community impact that this franchise once had. And it's just slowly totally. but surely over the last, we don't want to revisit it, but over the last 20 years, slowly but surely, it's just been poured out. And now they're trying to get it back. And in less than 12 months, I think they're doing a pretty good job. Wow. Yeah. You know, I grew up 15 minutes from, from RFK Stadium, you know, just just out in PG County. And there, was, there wasn't any question. All of my friends, everybody I went to school with, you know, except for the occasional, you know, Dallas Cowboy fan that just wanted to be contrarians. It was 100%. Everybody was all in, you know, on, on being a fan of the team and supporting the team. And like you said, it was that sense of community. And for me, like, that's how I connected, you know, my parents coming over from Italy. They adopted the team and they mm -hmm. loved the team too. So I was like, we just, it is the entire community was connected and we've lost that. And hopefully it's a different time. It's a different era, but hopefully we could start to, to bring that back. Yep. Right. Yeah. I had, I had to mention that because I feel that's that awesome. that, the way they started off that's the draft, awesome. I think that, you know, anything after that, I was like, wow. Yeah. yeah, they did. yeah. I mean, cause you could see it. They did it the day of the draft. And I'm like, that's a stroke of genius honoring the past before moving on to the present. Right. And I so, think that that was great. Totally. Yep. Well, yeah, Lou, you've been really generous with your time. We don't want to keep you for any longer, but this has been great. Uh, love having you on. Oh, this is great. I hope we can do it again. I'll be out there this week. This week is um, the rookies get out there, the rookie camp. That's right. Um, yep. So we get to see all those guys run around and get learning the playbooks and everything like that. So uh, it's going to be exciting. And as a new head coach, I think Quinn gets an extra set of OTAs or something like that. So it's going to be it's going it's going to be a uh, a fun off season because it's just a lot of newness and uh, always always enjoy being on with you guys. Yeah, I look forward to your reporting yeah. on all that stuff. We'll be looking out for it, and everyone else should be as well. Thanks, guys. For sure. Well, I know it's been a while, Lou. I don't know if you remember how we do our sign off here, but I always say I've been Dom. And Pop goes, this is Pop. And you can throw in a this is Lou right after that, and we can wrap this thing up. That sound good? Okay, yeah. All right, and we'll, uh, we'll get you on again soon, hopefully in uh, less time than there was between the last okay. podcast. It would be great. Love to have you on again. Yeah. All right, I've been Dom. This is Pop. This is Lou. And uh, thanks for another great week. Lou, thank you so much for your time. Guys, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Check out all of Lou's socials. They'll be linked in the description. Have a great week, everybody.